No, he actually sent me a Slack. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he said, I might be running late, and by running late, mean not coming at all. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, do you know why? Uh, morning tea. He's hosting a morning tea. He's hosting a morning tea. Okay, um, first of all, housekeeping as always. Assignment is due this week, Friday. Unfortunately, I will be away Thursday, Friday, so today's your last day to get help if you need it. Um, also, um, because I'm away this weekend, I probably, I'll try and mark it on Sunday when I get back. But it might not be done till Monday night, so we return. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, if you haven't noticed, two things on the website. I have put up Gary's exam from last year and the solutions to give you an example. When we get closer, I'll talk about the exam and how it's different or the same as Gary's, etc. But that will give you a good idea. Obviously, things you should look at. Last year's exam. Gary, uh, my assignments, the stuff we've done in that. Anytime we've gone through and there's some proofs that we don't complete here, it's always a good idea. They're nice little fresh material for us to give. The one thing I'm going to add that will be different to Gary's exam is um, I did it like a practical exam, but we can't change it at this point. But what I'm going to do is there'll be at least one question when I um, will put in output from R. And you should be able to use that output for interpretation and calculations, etc. So make sure you're comfortable with what we've been doing in R. The other thing I might do is I'm not going to ask you to write R code, but I might give you R code and say, can you explain what this is doing? Are you going to comment it well? Hopefully. <laughs> but you should be able to look at it and have a good idea of what it will be doing. Okay. The other thing is, your presentations, I've now put the hand up for the presentations. I will be randomizing the different methods. What I might do is I might put up a list of the methods, so you can actually go, please don't have that one in. But then I will be randomizing both the order and the presentations. The details about the presentation, that will be on the Friday lecture of week 11. The details are there, but basically, because there's 11 of you, you will be doing a four minute presentation explaining a method to a domain expert and I've given you a rubric there to give you the ideas of what you should think about. You do not use slides, you can use the document camera of a piece of paper if you want to and that's it. You are quickly explaining one of these methods to domain experts. You'd be glad to know that I have actually asked four of my collaborators to come and they will be your markers. So we have Professor Mark Hutchinson, Professor Joe and Bowen, a senior lecturer, Janet Kohler, and Bastian from ACAD, who will come and actually judge on how well you explain these methods. So the idea is, it's a key thing of a data scientist, it's the ability to explain these methods to a non-statistical audience. So short, sweet, so we're five percent final mark. Cool. But details are on the web page and also on. Oh, that's weird. So, now I'm going to change from what we've done before. I'm going to start doing tree based methods. So, they're sometimes referred to as carts, which are classification and regression trees. And then next week, we'll start doing bagging, boosting, and then random forest. Okay? So, to motivate this, we're going to look at this baseball data because we love it so much. And I've obviously become really, really, really well rounded in baseball. So you've got these hitters, and let's say we just wanted to use this data to predict salary. Well, a regression tree will produce something like this. So if you've not seen this before, this is used a lot in the biological fields, but this is a tree that you can use to make decisions to try and classify. So what you do is you start at the top. And the first thing you do is you'll say, well, for your prediction for this individual batsman, What's the years that they've been actually playing professional? Is it, in this case, less than 45? And if it's less than 45, you go to the left. If it's greater, you go to the right. And you basically follow down making a series of if statements until you get to an endpoint, and then that will give you the predicted salary in thousands of dollars. So it's a nice, easy, and collaborators love this because it's a not, they're used to sort of these, what we call decision trees or just trees. So here, if they're greater than 4.5, you go to the right, you come down. The next question is hits, the number of hits. Is it less than 117.5? Go this way. If it's greater, you go this way. 
So you can follow down a load of if statements or a load of decisions, and they're all binary decisions until you get to a prediction. And what classification trees will do is they will produce this for us automatically. So let's think about how they produce it. What it's actually doing is it's taking, in this case, we've got our years and hits, and it's actually converted it into a whole set of regions. Rectangular, non-overlapping regions is the way it's working. So that first decision took years and put a line and split, and it basically split it into region R1, and then the whole region to the right. And then it went back, and now he's got this extra split where he's taken the region to the right and split it into R2 and R3. And then what it does, it does a simple rule of, once you've got down to your regions, your prediction is going to be the mean salary for everyone in that region. Okay. So the whole concept is the space has been split, in this case, into three rectangular regions. R1 was just all the years less than 4.5. R2 was for the years greater than 4.5, but hits were less than 117.5. Well, the final one. So you've partitioned this into rectangular non-overlapping regions. So how did it actually do this splitting concept? How has it decided to do it? Um, just so you can confirm, if you look at the nodes, I just quickly did here, I did some filter and some mean, just to show that the predicted values are the values that we get there. So once you get down to the regions, the prediction is just the mean of all the observations within that region in your training data set. So, some notation. This is a tree. First of all, you might go, it doesn't look like a tree. Trees in computer science are upside down because you have the sort of the root at the top and then it hangs upside down and then you get all your leaves at the end. What do you mean? Obviously. Obviously, yes, obviously to computer scientists, but to the rest of the world, it's upside down. So the bits where you get to the end, the terminal nodes are called leaves or terminal nodes. The points where the predictor splits are called internal nodes. And then the links between the nodes are called branches. And the point right at the top is called the root. All good? Yeah. So how do we build this regression? What we're going to do is we're going to divide our predictor space, which is our x1 up to xp, into j distinct and non-overlapping regions, r1 up to rj. And then for every observation that falls in the j region, we predict the value that's the mean of all the responses to the points that lie within that. So we just have to find this way of converting, getting these non-overlapping regions. Well, what we're going to do, our heuristic, is we're going to find a set of regions, R1 up to Rj, that minimize our residual sum of squares. So we're going to take every observation minus its predicted, and its predicted would be the mean of the region that it lies within, square add up over all of them. And the way it does it is it actually uses a recursive binary splitting. So recursive, it makes a step and then it starts with that new point and it makes another step. And at each point, the only thing it decides is how to do a split. So at each point it comes and it will choose a variable to split on. It will split. And then it will take one of them regions and it will look at that region afresh and decide where to split on that region. So it just, so it's a recursive one. It's top down because it starts with all the data and slowly adds more splits. It's a greedy approach because it doesn't look ahead. There might be that perhaps in two or three steps time, if I made a different split now, I could get a better residual sum of squares. No, all it cares about is at every step going, what's the best improvement in the residual sum of squares that I can get? So as I said, top down starts at the top of the tree and successfully splits predictor space. And what it does is it will look at all the variables and go, which variable and which cut point in that variable will best improve my RSS. That's the one. Now it would have, once you've done that, two regions, it would look at them two regions and say, 
one of them, which one can I split? Go to the other one, one of them. In fact, you can just actually, it's parallel. You can just, once you actually split a region, all you care about about the next step is the points within that region. So if you go all the way back to the very first one, it probably, in this case, looked at all the variables and said, what's the best variable to split on years? Where should I split? Right, and I have these two regions. And then it would go, and you can set aside one process and say, go to R1. Is there a split there that we need? Go to all the stuff to the right of that line. Is there a split there that we need? So all the time, you recursively go in and grabbing a region and saying, can I split it? Grab a region, can I split it? So you're recursively doing it. And you can set your processes off doing that, and they can do it in a parallel fashion, so it is fast. I'm not going to get you to implement this. Basically, because actually representing trees in R is just rubbish. So the split. What we do is we consider all possible predictors, J, and all possible splits, S, within that predictor. And we find the way the best one of the best split that will actually minimize our residual sum of squares. So you try, you're taking a region, you're trying different splits in terms of predictor and cutoff. And out of all then you go, which one gives us the best decrease in residual sum of squares? Great, that's it. Now let's go to the next step. Make sense? Is it only splitting on one of the two regions? It is recursive. I, th I don't know exactly how they do it. They could actually just keep feeding back in and saying, here's a region, off you go, here's a region, off you go. Yeah, because like the, so the year's less than 4.5, it didn't split that again, but it could, no. it could have or it couldn't? Could have, absolutely could have done. It just didn't find there was enough reduction in residual sum of squares. Right. And to be honest, that isn't the final tree. What you normally do is you say, well, how do you do it? You either keep splitting every single region until you just get one point, mm -hmm. which is a really deep way of doing it, Often there's usually a cutoff. Usually when you first fit it, you'll say, keep going until each region has five or more points. You can also do an argument where you say, keep going until a split doesn't reduce the residual sum of squares by a certain amount. That one was actually a prune tree, the one I showed you for the, in the first example. But you find that when we actually fit it, it puts a lot more. But yes, the first time you fit it, it will just often go, and it's usually the cutoff is, the default is five. It will keep splitting every region until every region has no less than five. No less than five? I mean, that's one region, right? No, no, but you can, you can go, if I have 10 points, I can split that one into two, five. But once I get to a, a region that has five, I'm not gonna split that anymore. Okay, set. Right. Yeah. Like no more than five? No, no less than five. Uh, doesn't okay. uh, I think my, my, my logic would go, if I look at a region and a split would reduce in a region that has less than five, I wouldn't do it. Right, got you. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> so how do they actually do it? They grow this huge tree, which they really overfit. They just do this T0 where they will just go until you have lots and lots of small regions with you know five nodes in it. Then they prune it. So what you're going to do is by pruning it, you're going to go down and you'll have certain bits where you have lots and lots of branches going down. You're going to cut that and make that into a single region. So they call that pruning. And they prune back to give a subtree. So how do they do this? They do a thing called a cost complexity pruning or the weakest link pruning. So there's this theorem, I'm not going to go into the details of the theorem, but basically says if I choose a non-negative tuning parameter alpha, then for any individual given alpha, there will exist a subtree of T0 such that this heuristic now, which is the summation, is as small as possible. So if you came along with an alpha and say, here's my tuning parameter, I could take your big tree and I could look at all the possible subtrees and I would find one that will minimize that. So what is this heuristic? Well, first term, that summation, it's just really a residual sum of squares. Plus, what we've got, the other one, the alpha, is our tuning parameter. The absolute value of t is just going to be the number of terminal nodes in our tree. So it's very similar to all the penalty terms we've seen before, like AIC. 
you have a measure of how well it fits, your residual sum of squares, the first term, plus there's a penalty term. And the penalty term is taking into account how overfitted you are. So in this case, you've got a penalty term of don't have too many leaves because that means it's an overfitted model. And the idea being that you can get this whole series of subtrees of slowly improving. You don't actually do that. There's a quick, nice code where you can actually just quickly look at internal nodes. And if you just say, let's collapse an internal node. So instead of having all the branches beyond it, you just have that node with the, that becomes the new region. So it's like taking that region that has all these various bits and just going, let's see that. If you find the one that when you collapse it gives the smallest per node increase in RSS, that ends up doing it. Again, you don't do all this stuff. It's all done for you. Now, obviously, now you have to go, well, can I choose the number of... Um, so you basically go and you start with this big tree that's overfitted. You can reduce it by collapsing internal nodes. But if you do that, it doesn't fit as well. So you've got this balancing act between... I don't want it to be too flexible, I want it to be less flexible. So you've got your standard bias various trade-off. How do you choose how many leaves? It's going to be cross-validation. So here's our example when I actually do the full one. So how do we fit trees? There's a library called tree, which you install. And we've got a standard format. The function is tree. You give the uh, response variable, in this case salary tilde dot which says on everything else and you give it the data and it will give you this huge um, overfitted tree so this is actually the output and the, the format of this is you can see the splits the first one you've got the root at one tells you it's the root tells you we've got 263 observations my deviant which is my residual sum of squares is this huge number the five million um, and the average value of everything in that overall region, so the average salary of all the data set is 535.9. So then your first one is this two and three. So two is for all the ones where your C hits is less than 450. In total, there's 117 of those. The other alternative in that decision is that no, it's greater than 450. Notice it chooses a point that's not actually an observation because then it'd be stuck if you actually have exactly 450. Which is why before you often saw things like less than 117.5. So it chooses a point that lies between data points, not is a data point. And it just keeps splitting. This describes all the splits. And eventually you can see that some of them, like for example, number four, has an asterisk at the end which indicates that this is a leaf. So this is actually the description. You could use this in a series of if-else statements to actually get any prediction. Because now if you come along with your data, you could go down it, you know, the prediction does it. Or you can just go down your picture. How you plot it, it's a bit weird how you plot it. You go plot, which gives you the tree, and then you go text, which adds the actual text on top. Um, there's another thing we'll see later that if you go comma and I think it's pretty equals and then four, it tells you how many, we'll see when we get to categorical, how much of the information, the labels it gives you. So if you don't do that, it will just say, you know, if your level A go this way, if your level B or C go this way, which is usually useless because you don't know what level A is. So you put pretty fine, it gives you the first point. So we'll see that we get classification. So this is the full model there. Um, I haven't done a ggplot2 because you can't do it in ggplot2. I've tried my hardest to do a ggplot2 and nothing seemed to work very nicely. So if someone can find how to do in ggplot2 nicely, I'd love to steal your code. There's a thing called ggtree, but that's for phylogenetic trees and it does it all the wrong way and it doesn't quite match. You can get a summary of this information, but you can also prune it. So here what I've done is I've pruned back and I've printed out um, basically how many leaves I have and what my residual sum of squares is. And what you should notice as we go through these is, as I reduce the number of leaves, my residual sum of squares increases. So you've got this offset. Uh, trees that are smaller are not fitting as well, but trees that are getting larger are starting to overfit, and you have to have that balancing act, this bias various trade-off. So you can see that as these decrease, the RSS is increasing. 
And in fact, what I've done here is I've plotted the number of leaves on the x-axis and the RSS. Uh, you can see exactly the same. As I increase my number of leaves, my residual sum of squares gets down, which makes sense. If I got down to the point that every region was an individual node, I'd be predicting it perfectly. You can actually get to the point that you can just fit everything perfectly, but it's an overfitted model. And a lot of when we come back on next Monday and we look at bagging, boosting, and random forest is about dealing with the fact that these really can overfit your data too much. So you can do a CV. You just take your tree and you go CV tree, and now it will give you the number of leaves and it will give you your cross validation error. It's all doing it in the background. Usual thing. It's taking so many aside, it's fit to the tree, it's then predicting the rest, working out the residual sum of squares between your set aside data and how it compares, work out the average and put it all together. So for this one, you can see the lowest point is either three or four. Four would probably be the best. I chose three in the first one just because it was a nice, easy one for you to understand. Okay. Classification. So we've done the RT of cart, now we'll do the C. So now we've got a categorical response. I haven't talked about categorical predictors. We will see it indirectly as we go through. But usually what it does, when it comes to the decision, it will say something like, with this categorical variable, if your level's A, B, C, you go this way. If you're maybe D and E, you go this way. So it's talking about individual levels, which way they go. So we've got a categorical response variable. So we need to make a prediction for each region. And the way we predict is we go to that region and we say, for the categorical variable, what is the most common level in that region? So it's what we call a consensus vote. So you sort of take your, you take your points in that, and if like three out of four were level A, you would, anyone that's in that region, you would predict as level A. So how are we gonna do the criteria? So we've got a node M which represents our region M. It's got NM observations. And then what we could do is we can calculate the proportion for each level in that region. So you go to that region and you calculate what proportion of the categorical variable are the first level, what proportion of the second level, what proportion of the final level. And then what we set the prediction for that level, which I denote as KM, is going to be the arg max of all these proportions, i.e which level is most common in that region. So, given that, how can we measure how good our fit is? Before we had our RSS, how are we going to do it in this one? Well, there's multiple ones. The first one, and the easiest one to understand, is the misclassification rate. So you go to your region, you've decided that everyone in that region is going to be classified by the most common. So you then say, how many are misclassified, i.e. they're not that region? Which, if you think about it, must be 1 minus the proportion that are that region. Because they're all the ones that obviously are misclassified. The Gini index is the next one. You go now to a node and you work out what proportion of level one, what proportion of level two, what proportion of level three. And for each of these, you take the proportion of level one and multiply it by one minus that. You get plus the proportion of level two with one minus that, plus the proportion of level three, one minus that, and you add it all together. What are all the levels? So a categorical variable oh, okay. right. has different, what we call levels. Right, so just one for each category? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, no, one for each level within each category. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other one people often use is called the cross entropy. Um, I've put deviance there because that's what tree package often calls it, the deviance. But it's a cross entropy where now you calculate the proportion within each category or level, and then you take the log of that and multiply it by that, and you add up all that and take the negative. And that's your entropy or your cross entropy. So these are all different ways you can measure how well your data is fitting. And then obviously you can do that for each region, and then you can just add them up over the whole tree. 
just to give you an indication, I've just done here where I have a category with just two levels. And what we've got on the x-axis, I'm saying what proportion are in class two. So we've got class one and class two. And as you can find, as your proportion gets closer to the half, so the first, um, basically on the left-hand side of 0.5, I'm going to classify everything as class one. Make sense? Because class two is less than 0.5, hence class one must be greater than 0.5, so I'm going to classify everything as class one. And then I suddenly get closer towards 0.5, you find that this error rate goes up, which makes sense. What you really want is regions where everyone is of one group. When they're 50-50, you know you're going to make a mistake approximately 50% of the time. So first of all, the green line, you see that that slowly increases until suddenly I slip over. Now I'm starting to classify everything as class two because that's now the most common and now my error rate decreases down. The blue line is the Gini and the red is the cross entropy. So basically you can see that any node that is about 50-50 or basically any node that has about equal amounts of each level is going to have a, a high error rate well as they get more and they call about purity as they become dominated by a single level they become more pure you find that your error rates all go towards zero and now at last we have a data set that i can understand and you lot might not understand as well so fuck you all thank goodness now we're going to look at heart data I understand this kind of a medical background, not because I'm a fat fuck and my doctor tells me about it a lot. Although he does tell me about it a lot. So what we've got here is we've got data from a cardiovascular clinic that was looking at trying to predict with various measures where people are having basically acute heart disease. So by acute heart disease, we're talking about acute angina or we're talking about um, heart attacks equivalent, so myocardial infarction. See, I do know this stuff is so good. Baseball, fuck. So what's X Ang? Which one? X Ang. Oh shit, X Ang was... Extreme angina. Oh, it was a mention of angina. It's the amount of pain that you get. So angina is pain that is caused in the chest because you're not getting enough blood going through the cardiac vessels. A lot of these are about ECGs, so you should look in electrical cardiogram. Um, so the rest ECG, they've got measures on whether it's abnormal or not. The slope is looking at things like the ST. So your ECG has a PQRST. And by looking at that, you can look at whether there's effects in the myocardial muscle. Cool. But what we really want to do at this point is we want to be able to predict if someone is going to have acute heart disease by looking at things like the ECG. We use a thallium test. So thallium is radioactive, you inject it in someone, you can then get them to do exercise and you can look at the perfusion of the blood through the heart, through the vessels, etc. Okay? So, it's pretty much the same. You go tree, you now give it AHD. The key thing I discovered is you do need to make sure that, notice how I've set AHD as a factor. Remember when you read underscore CSV, read underscore CSV, if that's the one you use from the tidyverse, doesn't automatically convert every character column to a factor. If you don't convert it to a factor, R has a hissy fit. So that's why I've actually put this here. You can see I got rid of the ID, I didn't need that. And I went mutate if, so I said, go to every single column that is a character and convert it to a factor. So that's a quick way of converting it to a factor. A lot of you will just use read.csv. Remember, read underscore CSV is faster. And you really shouldn't be converting things to factors unless they are categorical variables. Aren't a lot of these categorical variables? Yes, they all are in this case. Right. Well, the I mean, cholesterol is not the. Um, no, uh, resting blood pressure, cholesterol, um, fasting blood sample. Um, your angina measure, uh, your maximum heart rate, all these. The only real categorical are the type of chest pain, whether you have it, whether it's asymptomatic, non-anginal chest pain. Um, the other one is the thallium result, which like, is... Like sex looks like it's just a binary, but they put it, like it looks like they put it in as one or zero, but it looks like a yeah. category. It, I could convert that to a fact, it would make no difference to the analysis. Yeah. 
So what does AHD stand for? Um, acute heart disease. So we're trying to predict whether that's going to happen or not. Yeah. Yeah. So you, what happens is someone comes in and they have chest pain. And chest pain can be caused by an acute heart disease, but it could be caused by things like an asthma attack, a panic attack. There's all various things that can cause this sort of stuff. And there's various tests they can use to go, are you having a heart attack or not? The classic one is a friend of mine. He basically just felt a little bit old one day. And he went down to the doctor and said, I think I've got flu, I feel a bit sweaty. They went, no, what you're having is a heart attack. I mean, his was cool. wouldn't have had his stress levels here right now. Yeah, no, no, it's amazing. It increases the rate. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, you have to sort of go, I got some good news and some bad news. But if you can just sit down there while I tell you the bad news. <laughs> The good news. We're just lie. already the doctors. <laughs> we just lie down actually on this. Yeah, just lie down very carefully. No surprises. No, no. That's it. Just nice and relaxed. So this is how we're going to fit it. But as I said, the key thing is you need to let AHD know that it's a factor. Okay, so here's my tree. Now, first of all, notice that I've used the pretty equals four. So you can see the first one, it looks at the thal. So the thal, when they inject the thallium, they can say, is there heart valve defects? And have they been treated or not? So this has numerous levels. And so what it's saying is, if you go to thal and it's normal, go to the left. If it's any other level, go to the right. So that's how categoricals work. Which would also make sense. Yeah, but you can see that some of them like chest pain, if you're NNNG, NNTY, TYPC, go to the left, else go to the right. And ideally what you do is there should be enough letters there for you to identify. So you actually go and look at all the levels of that and see how they go. So what do you notice that's strange about that? But for the CA, why did they both say less than 0 0.5? Because once you split that region, you can still go and split their regions individually. All oh, right. Yep. Yep. That's a good question. Though there's another thing you should notice as well. Yep. Okay. Like for example, the four leftmost lead nodes are all, or even the five leftmost are all nodes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we can just ignore the lead yeah. nodes and sum it up at a higher level. Yeah. I mean, the reason they do this is it increased purity. So even though this is no and this is no, by splitting it, it made it a bit more pure. So this idea of what they call purity, that this is one of the problems of, you're right, most of the, you know, this whole sub-branch on the far left, the leaves, all five leaves are no. You don't actually change your prediction, but if you went down to the regions and you looked within them, by splitting you increase the purity. You manage somehow to split it and end up going, oh, excellent, I had a lot more no's in each of their no's. What's, what's purity in, like, Measurable sense? Um, purity would be, for example, you would increase, uh, so you'd decrease your genie, you would decrease your entropy, you'd also decrease your mis not quite your misclassification rate, because all of these, every single one that's in there, but definitely when it comes to genie and cross entropy, mm -hmm. you'll be decreasing that because you've got that separation. It does like what they call purity, that is, when you look at an individual region, there's a hell of a lot of one single level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could like manually prune it, right? Because the next, after the thal, the next pre actual predictor is chest pain. But you could just take out that whole calcium. Yep. I don't understand how it would have worse stats if the predictive ability is exactly the same. Um, well, it depends on how you're going to count predictive ability. So one of my big problems with your tree is going to be this overfitting. It's gone to things. So we are going to prune it in a second and actually make it better. And we'll see what happens. But the problem is, remember, it's that greedy algorithm. Like in sensible way, you went, oh, seriously, do I need to split on calcium? But it doesn't know that the other region is going to be split on calcium. It's this recursive splitting. Mm. It's not sharing information. It's a greedy algorithm. So just because this region over here is splitting on calcium, it doesn't do what you did, but you look over the other region and go, oh, we're both splitting on calcium. Tell you what, let's get together and not do this. Because it's just doing this recursive. It splits it. Once it's got that region, it looks at that region blindly. It's not using the rest of the information. So that's one of the problems with this methodology, is that it makes it fast, it's recursive, but it's a greedy algorithm. 
So it can't do clever global looking at that and saying, look, I seriously can improve this. Now you could do it by hand by looking at it, but we often don't, we just let it do. And in fact, we go and do random forest instead. Right. So here you can see, I can do my cross validation on my tree. Um, now the function I've used to do it is uh, the prune mist class because I'm doing, I can choose the Gini or the Gini, the entropy or the misclassification rate. I use the misclassification rate to choose how to prune. The default is the RSS. So your default is for when you're doing regression trees. We've got an eight and here's my new eight. Still splits exactly as you said. That first region is splits and it still splits on calcium, the next one. But that's just because of the nature of this process. Any questions on that? So when do linear models and trees work better? Or, well, obviously you can see is my very pathetic examples here. The top left. If my region split into the green and the yellow, in that top left, you're not going to be a linear model. If you're going to split that region, something like an LDA is going to work really, really well. And you can see that the top right is that, you know, once you're trying to do this, you've got these two predictors, X1 and X2, and you're trying to predict whether it's rare, sorry, yellow or green. The rectangles just are not fitting that very nicely. but if, now you go to the second row, if your data really does fit into regions of like rectangular type thing, now your classification tree is gonna work so much better. Because your linear models, your LDAs and that are really good at finding sort of diagonal lines, while one's really good at finding, you know, rectangles. Advantages, they are very easy to explain to the people who are your end users, they love the tree. They can use it, they don't need a computer. You know, if you think about that heart one, I now don't need a computer to do prediction. I can print that on my wall, and when someone comes in, I can get their results, and I can make a decision by following it down. And decision trees like that are used a lot in medicine. You don't have time for computers, what you do is you have, you have decision charts that either you have in your head, or you have on the thing that basically says do this and make this decision and you follow down and that's how you do stuff. So they're really, really useful for the end users. They actually model human decision processes. It's actually how, I don't know, for medicine, how you do diagnostics. You know, these are decisions you're making. I mean, the classic one is the, the what we call the Dr. A, B, C, D, F, G, H for emergency medicine. Coming. Okay, so you've got first of all danger response. So then you've got air, so you get your airway, because if you haven't got an airway, you can't do diddly squat. You get your breathing, you get your cardiovascular system going. D is for drugs, E is for ECGs. Then G and H. Hey, um, What's an ECG? Um, you put your ECG on, you're measuring the heart activity. All right. Um, we used to say G was for GH was for go home, because it was better by then, or for gin. F was fluid, so I didn't do fluids. So that's how, I mean, you seriously, because you know, if you like to do emergency medicine, you have four minutes, that's it. So you just have that in your head and you just run through it and you're like, do an airway, don't think. I mean, the problem is you used to also crack the chest and you need to warn people if you're gonna do that. So me and my friend did emergency medicine and we had a dog that had got a cardiac arrest. So we'd done A, B, C, D, got to the point it wasn't going, so we went fine. And I just went, we'll crack the chest. We didn't tell the nurse we we're going to crack the chest. What happens when you crack the chest is the dog's asleep on the table. You get a shaver, you go like that. You get a scalpel, you go like that, and you go rip, and you go in. What you do then is you go and catch the nurse. Well, you don't, because your hands are in the dog's chest. You go, nurse, and the nurse just goes bang, because you didn't realize that when we say crack the chest, it's going to be a very intensive process for a minute. And then you do aortic clamping and all sorts. It's great fun. I highly recommend it. All right. And then you cut the chest for heart palpitations. Yeah, because you, you can't you can't outside. do it properly outside. So you crack the chest, you go in, then you can get it. What you do is you start, someone's basically manipulating, and then we do what we call aortic clamping. So you get a catheter, and you wrap it around the descending aorta, you clamp it. So that basically means all the blood is not going to the end of the dog, it's only going to the brain. 
one of the boys for hockey with did a murder, does uh, the doctor and did emergency retrievals and he was saying he hadn't done that once to a person. Yeah, I've done it a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh the thing is you don't think about it, you just do it. But then you sort of all these people just fading away and like, sorry. <laughs> and the problem is you can't do anything. Like you seriously like normally if someone starts to fake, if you're doing surgery, the worst is when you're doing surgery and you have UVs in there and they go to faint in your wound and basically you just go smack and you smack them because they can't go into the wound. And you're like, and normally we say is, if you're gonna faint, faint over there. <laughs> They're like, why did you hit me? Because you can't contempt them. Anyway. Um, does deal with qualitative really nicely, these decision trees, highly recommend them. And people love that tree diagram. That, it's really nice graphics. So it's all about the end user. The end user love it. We hate it. Why do we hate it? They sometimes do not have the same predictive accuracy of remembrance and they're really non-robust. This is the big problem. What I mean is you only need to permute your data a little bit and your tree completely changes because they're really overfitting. And that's what we're going to talk about next week, how we can take this, which is a nice idea, and improve it a lot to get something a lot better which we're going to head towards eventually next week, Random Forest. That's it. Cool. Any questions? Good. Don't forget you have an assignment. Go and look at the presentation details on Canvas. If you have any questions about that, please get on Slack. If you have any questions, I will be here today, but not tomorrow or Friday. Um, that's it. Next week, we will do Random Forest and I think then support vector machines. Cool, thank you very much. See you then.